Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's live stream. Hopefully, you can hear me okay. Uh, last time, I remember there were some issues with audio, if you guys can let me know. Uh, Brad, if you can let me know if the sound is good, audio is good, video is good. All right, SE Brad. All right, cool. Looks like we're good. We're live. Uh, welcome again to today's live stream. It's been a few weeks since I've been on. It's always a pleasure to be here with you guys. On the keyboard, as usual, I have my colleague and fusion wizard, Mr. Brad Tallis. Feel free to drop any questions in the chat and uh, Brad will answer those. And if there's anything uh, that you want to ask and direct it at me, then drop that in the chat also. Brad will let me know and I can uh, address those as they come. I'll do my best to answer all the questions. Sometimes we do run out of time. Brad and I are notorious for going over. And uh, yeah, so we appreciate you guys. So with that, taking a uh, quick uh, look. All right, great. So what we're doing today is I'm going to show you guys how I programmed this part. I've showed this in many live streams. This is a part I did uh, for the uh, for Haas Automation at the SEMA show in Las Vegas, Nevada. It was also showcased at South Tech and uh, PRI show, Performance Racing Industry in Indianapolis. Uh, so we had a live machine in the booth and we were cutting chips and making this part live. So uh, it started out with a piece of stock, obviously, this is the first operation done and I held it in the vise, but uh, you can see the general size of it and it was about that thick. So you can kind of get an idea of the material and you can see the little serrations in the material there uh, from the jaws that were gripping it in the vise. And I'm going to talk through all of this step by step and what I did to make this part. So as I said, if there's any questions, drop them in the chat. Mr. Brad will, uh, let me know. And then there's also threads in here, like uh, pipe thread. So I got a 3 8 pipe thread. Let me see if I can't get that guy in there. So we got a pipe thread there. We got over here. We got two different sizes. We got this guy here. So I'm going to show you guys how I did that. So those are tapered threads. So I got a quarter inch, uh, quarter inch 18 NPT and a 3 8 18 NPT. I'm going to show you guys how I did that. So let me switch screens here. All right. So here's uh, the basics. Let me go to the design side just to show everything there. So that's what it looked like uh, in Fusion. And you can see I got the, the table of the machine. This was done on a Haas UMC 500. And I've got some Lang zero point work holding. I've got some vices. And then on the first operation, we have that rectangular stock. And then I did all the machining on this side, on this face, even tilted it up at an angle to, to drill those holes there and to thread those. So I'll show you guys how I did that. And then we hop over to the secondary operation and did, did it on this side here. But what I wanted to show you is some things um, that I was posting on Instagram. Uh, feel free to uh, di uh, direct message me on Instagram. I get people all the time uh, reaching out and asking questions on Cam. So here's a little uh, view of what it looked like. Um, if I go over here, uh, here's what the setup looked like on the machine. So it looks very close to what the Cam uh, uh, or the modeling, the CAD and Cam looks like in Fusion. Uh, so you can see that and then if I step through you can see what what uh, the first operation looks like and Here's the secondary operation looking at it from the top and then some other angles some other Viewpoints of the part so you can see the threads there. Uh, you can see there's some chamfers here I'm going to show you how I did all of that and though again those uh, those holes are tapered threads so and I even did some engraving so just wanted to show you guys some of this. Here's some more of the modeling side and there's uh, like a rendering of it. Okay, 
Then the other thing I wanted to show, I got this guy here. So that was the machine actually. That was the UMC 500. And uh, we uh, partner with Haas uh, to do these. It's a super privilege to do it. Uh, they ask us uh, to assist in creating the demos and it's uh, a highlight of what I do here at Autodesk. I love, uh, love doing these types of events. Okay. Uh, what else? So I had a video of it here. Um, if you can't tell, I'm a cyclist. <laughs> Funny tan lines. Okay, I think it was this guy. There we go. Get some video of it uh, doing some swarf, some five axis swarf cuts to uh, do the chamfers. Totally overkill, but I did it because I could. It just, uh, it's fun doing that kind of machining. And again, a little bit more chamfering. There's other techniques that you could use to do that, but uh, so I use a side flute of the end mill, and that's just going to loop through. And here's another view of that. There's a, the solid piece of stock. These are the jaws, the soft jaws, before I machine them, before I machine the pocket. And uh, here's another view of that. So with that, let me come back to, uh, I can close that. And again, uh, Drop in on this one. People ask me some things, so I do drop some tips and tricks uh, in my Instagram. Uh, here's an old photo of me from <laughs> 1990 when I had hair uh, in, a, in a machine shop. And uh, here's another video of that. Here's another part I made. Here's some setups. So I do quite a bit of stuff on here. People reach out all the time. I paint. Uh, I do post Remember this one I did a few weeks back. So yeah, feel free to reach out. Here's a project I did on a Mazak Integrex. That was a cool project. That was some uh, awesome, oh, a little video of that. All right, carrying on. What else? Okay, uh, come back to this. Next, so let me make that full size. Okay, so here's the environment in design. And like I said, I've got the table, uh, the zero point lang, and uh, the vices. I've got my operation one, which is here on the left, and then operation two on the right. I kind of, when I lay things out on the machine table, I do it uh, like reading a book, uh, like starting from the left and moving right. So I generally, when I do a setup, I'll do the first operation on the left hand side, and then this part you can then flip over from here, flip it over there. Another thing that I also like to do and pay attention to is when I do, if you notice the part, that flat edge of the part is on the back. So then when I flip it over uh, to this side, I have that same uh, face on the back. So for example, like this face here that's highlighted in blue, that's the same as that face back there. So that just keeps things consistent uh, when you flip things over from operation one to operation two. So that's, uh, as a machinist, I like to keep things consistent. And so if you have an operator uh, and you tell them to just flip the part, keep the same side on the back, and then it's, it's um, harder to make a mistake. Obviously, I've got this shape cut out into the soft jaws. So if I hide one of these, you can see that's the pocket that I cut into the soft jaws to nest that part inside. And then obviously, if you look at it from this side, there's a gap in there so the jaws squeeze on that part. Okay, let me take a quick look at the chat. All right, thanks Brad for answering those questions. And uh, I also like to see where everybody's from. So if you wanna put in the chat where you're from, that'd be great. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Brad is in Colorado in the United States here. We're both in the US and it's nice to see where you guys are from. Okay, so let me come over to the manufacturing workspace. So when I switch over to the manufacturing workspace, obviously the icons will change at the top. And since I've already done this part, I'm just gonna go through and step through and talk about uh, the sequence of events that I did them and why, and then the result and some other things you can do to aid and assist and uh, just some tips and tricks along the way. So first thing that I did, uh, if I right mouse click and I edit that setup, 
Uh, I've got some things here. I'm going to deselect the machine that's in preview. Come over here. Um, so I got my Z normal is at face. The main thing I wanted to highlight was you see that X, Y, and Z, the RGB, red, white, and blue. So red, white, and blue. <laughs> red, green, blue. I'm thinking of the US flag. <laughs> All right. So my so the first two here are the orientation of my G54, in this case, my work coordinate system. So that is the where you set zero on your machine tool. So the top center where that area is there, that's my zero. And the reason why I selected that, because Lang, they have a, something that's called a gauging palette, and you mount that gauging palette in place of this vise. So this vise comes off, you mount the gauging palette, and then you probe the center of that location right there. And then, so these parts, uh, this is the zero point base from Lang. These are intended to stay always bolted on your machine tool. So once you have that coordinate or the zero point uh, where that lives, that white dot right there, that never changes. And then you can take the vise off, you can put a bigger vise, a smaller vise, another fixture that mounts in there, and you don't have to go back and find your zero. Same thing for the secondary operation. I did this guy here. I'll get to that when I get to the second op. So that is my G55, and it's going to be, the, again, the top center of that. And I use that method and that technique because it's uh, super easy, super useful. Uh, traditionally, uh, or in the old days, <clears throat> I remember before using a zero-point system, I would come and I'd maybe edge find the corner of a part, or if it's a cylindrical part, you'd maybe indicate it to find the center of it. Uh, so it just depends on uh, your machine and your equipment, but... Uh, in this type of a situation, that works beautifully. Super easy. All right. So, next. So I identified uh, what faces are my X and Z. So that's uh, the normal face. So my X is normal to that. Uh, my zero was that, you can barely see, I clicked on that line there. So it picks the center. The body is uh, what you are machining, so that's highlighted there in blue. And then the fixture, I've got 13 bodies in here. I just did that for uh, when I run the simulation that it, that it shows that. Now, the other part isn't in there, and that's because of a setting that I have selected, and I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, the next I wanted to talk to you about is this stock. So generally when you open these up, you'll have just these icons. And I know what they are, but if you're new to Fusion, I recommend uh, dragging this a little bit wider so you can see setup, stock, part position, post process. Uh, another thing I see people doing is they'll grab this and they'll undock it and move it around. I recommend just leaving it docked. So leave it docked. You grab it here and you'll drag it over to the right till you see a vertical green line. You see that? And then now I'll dock it. And then you can grab this handle here and make it bigger or smaller. Uh, more so on operations, I do that. And not, uh, when I get there, I'll show you what I mean. Okay, stock, going to the stock tab. Uh, I created the stock in my assembly uh, to represent that stock size. So I just said here under mode, uh, generally you do a relative or fixed or one of these. I just said uh, from solid. And then I picked that out of the browser here. You can navigate to here and find it, but it's right there. It's that stock for op one. So I selected that post process, uh, give it a program number, give it a little comment and WCS offset number one is G54. You could leave it as a zero. And then when you run the post processor, it will default to the first work offset, which is G54. Uh, but I like to force myself to give it a one to output that G54. If you're doing multiples where you have, uh, let's say you want to do G54 and G55 and they're the same thing, then you would need to tell it the, what the first work offset is. Okay, so I'm gonna hit okay here. So our setup is done. I'm gonna collapse that so we get a little more real estate on the screen. Got a little bit of a delay today. I don't know if it's uh, what's causing it, but uh, bear with me. All right, so I see a question. All right, let me. 
switch. I see a question Brad dropped here. So, Al, thank you for the question, asks, do you cut both soft jaws at the same time in a single cut operation? If so, how do you create the space between them? Great question, Al. So, what I do is, uh, these jaws, they, they uh, open and close, and I'll squeeze uh, something precise in there. Sometimes I'll use uh, parallels, which are uh, accurate. They're uh, about three millimeters thick, or about an eighth of an inch. Uh, so I use that to squeeze on it. And then when the vise is squeezed here, between, like, say, this face and this face, uh, then I cut this pocket in one operation, and I actually do have it in here. So if I go down to the end, you can see here, Op2, G55. This is the program that cut those soft jaws. So if I expand that, I did some facing, I cut that little uh, relief there, I cut the pocket, I finished the floor, and then I finished the walls, and then I deburred it. So that's how I went about that. I could uh, run simulation, uh, but you guys get the idea. So I did do it in one operation. Uh, I just kept those clamped together, and I uh, machined it like that, and it worked out really good. Hope that answers your question. Thanks, Brad, for dropping that in there. So now let me minimize those. I will expand this. So now I'll start talking through uh, the operations I, I did to create this and why I went in the order I did. Okay. So the very first thing I did, because this is a flat face, I faced it. And as I step through this, guys, there's um, uh, some settings down here. And let me show you this. I have three monitors uh, on my setup here, but and because the way they are oriented, uh, when I click on some of these drop downs, it bleeds off below my screen, so you can't see it. So I have to kind of uh, move this around so you can see it. But there's this icon down here in the bottom center, display in process stock, or you can hit F8. And then do you want it transparent or not? So that's solid. So you can see the, uh, the green is the material. Or if you do transparent, you can kind of see through it. So it's transparent. So I recommend uh, turning that on. And uh, there's another over here in utilities. You want this on also. So make sure you have that on as well. Okay, we'll come back to just this milling tab. So let me make this uh, bigger. Okay, so very first thing I did is I faced that. I did it in two step downs. And uh, let me run simulation here. Again, got a bit of a delay. I'll probably skip through some of these, but I just wanted to uh, go through this. Oh man, major delay on my end. Okay, there we go. So I faced that, and that exposed that top surface. So there's some settings in here uh, that you can see. Uh, so I can change this to something like that. And now it tightens up. So I got a 3 thou tolerance. So you can see the green is the finished part, and then the blue is material remaining. I'll go ahead and close that now. OK, next. So after I faced it, I went ahead and I roughed it with an adaptive roughing strategy, which is here under the 3D. It's that icon right there. Or if you click this drop down, it's adaptive clearing. And I like adaptive clearing uh, when you're doing uh, anything where you want to utilize the full flute length of the tool. So if I come over here and I do adaptive clearing, if I right mouse click and I take a look at some of the settings I did. So if I come over to, uh, obviously, the tool, you select your tool. I used a three-quarter inch bull nose. That's a 19 millimeter uh, size end mill. If 
for the international audience. Um, when you go to the geometry tab, look at stock contours and uh, what that checkbox does, it exposes that yellow rectangle. And what that yellow rectangle uh, shows is the stock that was created in the setup. And so that's a, a preview of that. And under REST machining, I say machine from previous operations. You do have some options here. You can do from setup stock. Uh, so it'll look at the setup and identify all the material from the setup. But if you do from previous operations, it will realize what was done prior. So it won't uh, cut where it doesn't need to. All right, heights, I just uh, uh, left uh, most of it default, but what I did do is on the bottom height, the bottom reference face, I selected the top jaw. So if I look at it from this side here, I selected the top jaw of the vise, which sits right there. So it's that blue face. Then I said, stay above that by 0.1, 100 thousandths. So by selecting that, I'm guaranteed that when my tool goes to that depth, it will not violate, it won't hit the part. Um, it won't hit the jaws, I should say. If I had this based off the model top or the model bottom, then what that can do is depending on where the part sits. So if I just say model bottom here, and if that value was zero, you can see that blue line moved below where the jaw is. And if I hit OK, let that generate. Got a little bit of a delay today, fellas. Actually, I, I should say gentlemen and ladies who are in attendance. So that's generating now. And then now what happens is uh, you will see something undesirable. So you would violate, you would uh, cut your jaws. So for those reasons, when I do something like this, I purposely pick on the Heights tab something that's a solid reference like this face. And then I will give it an offset, oops, 0.1. So regardless of where the model sits, if the model goes up or down, and if I'm in this orientation, so if the model goes up or down, the depth will always be based off that face. Highly recommend utilizing that when you're doing things like this. All right, uh, what else here under passes? I do turn smoothing on. Uh, what smoothing does is, uh, so I'm just hovering my mouse over that. And when smoothing is off, it's kind of hard to tell on that first image on the left-hand side. Uh, there's a straight line and then there's a little black dot in between. So it would do straight line, straight line, straight line to create that arc. But what you, what you can do is turn smoothing on. Uh, so that's the image on the right. And what that will do is it'll generate a, an arc move, whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. So clockwise would be a G2, counterclockwise would be a G3. So in between each of those black dots is a line of code. So your code is shorter, your toolpath uh, runs smoother. And uh, when I run some simulation, uh, I could talk about that and show that. So, and then on linking, I'll get to that in a moment. My stay down level, I usually use 70%. And then the maximum stay down distance, I usually generally here put something bigger than the, the longest distance of the part. So from left to right here, I make sure that that number is bigger so that my tool stays down. The other thing to pay attention to is this, no engagement feed rate. So when the tool is positioning uh, from cut to cut and it's not actually in the material, it's gonna be feeding at this feed rate. Uh, when it's cutting, it's gonna be cutting at the cutting feed rate, which is 240 inches per minute. When it's repositioning, it is running at this, and you'll see it now. Uh, I'm gonna hit cancel because I didn't really change anything, uh, but. So there's our tool path. So what I wanted to show you now is if I run 
a simulation. I'm going to talk about the smoothing briefly. I did talk about it. Okay, it looks like there's a question from Jan Gro Groman from Germany. Any updates on using the cutting preset, cutting preset as a parameter in the tool? Any updates on using the cutting preset as a parameter? I'll talk on that shortly. Okay. So if I show points here, and let me just turn off the stock just so you can see everything, and I'll show all toolpath. So you can see if I come out here, there's a straight line move here from there to there. And then if I rotate around here, you got that move, and then it goes to there. That's going to be a true arc in the code. So when it's uh, post-processing, it's going to give you a nice, smooth arcs. And just pay attention to kind of how many black dots are there. These yellow moves, that's that no engagement feed rate I was talking about when it repositions. So you want that to go really fast so you're not wasting time. So I'm going to uh, leave that show points on. And then what I'm going to do is on this adaptive roughing, um, I'm going to let me just take a look here. And just pay attention to the size of that toolpath is 36.3 kilobytes. Depending on the geometry and the size of the file, uh, that may or may not change quite a bit. So let me show you what I mean. If I go here, right mouse click, edit, and under passes, if I turn smoothing off, I'll hit OK so it regenerates it. We should see this number be different. So it's generating now. You can see the percentage. And holy moly, we're already halfway through the hour, and I'm only on the, the second. I really need to speed things up here. <laughs> All right, so you can see the file size is bigger. And when it's done calculating, when I run simulation, if I right mouse click and I say simulate, Oh, my depth is still wrong. I must have, uh... oh, because I think I hit cancel the last time. So let me fix that. Yeah, now thinking back to it, I think I hit cancel after I changed that. So we need to come into here. We need to edit that. I need to go to the heights tab. Yeah, I need to change that from model bottom to a selection. I'm going to grab this top face. And then I'll say... I want my toolpath a hundred thousandths above that. So you can see that blue line there. Cool. I'll say, okay. And if I look at passes, smoothing is turned off. Okay. So we're going to regenerate now. Give that a second to generate. We got 46 people watching. Awesome. And 18 likes. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Or we need, John, Jan says, I need a longer hour, yes. So what we'll do is if we run out of time, we'll just carry on on my next live stream in two weeks from today, and I'll touch on the rest. So um, now look at the size of that file. And this is what I really wanted to highlight. When you run simulation now, and we view those black dots that indicate uh, in between each one, see how many black dots there are? There's a lot more. Now why is that? It's because when you're rounding these corners here, each one of those is a straight line. So from here to here, that's just a straight line. And from there to there is a straight line. And from there to there. So if you're reading your G code, these would be a G1 with an X and a Y move, a G1 with an X and a Y move. So you, Fusion creates all these straight line segments to generate that arc. But you'll get, the, you'll get some faceting uh, in there. And you can see, especially like in this area where there's a lot of tighter, tighter moves and tighter motion. Whoops, my zoom got carried away there. So the size of file is bigger because there's more uh, control points. So X, Y, X, Y, X, Y. Whereas if you have an arc, it can go perhaps from this dot all the way to this dot in one arc. Uh, as long as that tolerance band is uh, obeyed by the tolerance you set. So that's one thing that I do like to 
highlight. So I'll uh, uncheck that. Eh, maybe for the rest of this, I'll leave that on since I talked about it. So let me go back, uh, change that to turn smoothing on, get that generating. And while that's generating, I'm going to take a look at the chat, see if there's any questions. Okay, Stuart Duncan asks, is there any time that you would, let me switch my, okay, Stuart Duncan asks, is there any time that you would not use smoothing? Um, is there any time that I wouldn't use smoothing? Smoothing, uh, I'll use it probably 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, it does increase calculation time. So if you have a part the size of this and you need to recalculate it with smoothing on, uh, you will get a certain um, calculation time. And then if you turn smoothing on or off, you'll get it'll with smoothing off, it will calculate quicker because it doesn't have to figure out each arc move and is it in the tolerance. So it will generate quicker. If you have a model, uh, sorry, a mold the size of, a, let's say you're machining a massive size mold and there's a lot of toolpath and that part is really big, it's going to take a long time to calculate that. Uh, so it depends on the model, depends on the size of the part, depends on your machine tool. Um, machines do run better when you have smoothing on. Uh, when it's machining and doing that, you'll get a nice smooth toolpath. If you're doing a straight line, straight line, straight line, like a lot of them, and they're in succession, you can sometimes get data starvation on the machine or stuttering, uh, and then the motion of the machine, it, it kind of chokes uh, on it and it can't keep up with the code. Uh, so generally, I'll use smoothing almost all the time. There are exceptions, though. Okay, coming back to this. All right. So let me unzoom here. For some reason, my computer is uh, a little jerky today. The motion is not smooth. Okay, so we did some roughing. You could see what uh, the toolpath does and what it leaves. And this is a three quarter inch diameter tool, which is about 19 millimeters. But you can see here in that, that corner radius right there, uh, the tool couldn't get in there nice, so that you can see the material that's left behind here, but not there. So what I did next, I grabbed another tool that was smaller. I went from tool 2 to tool 3, and when I did that tool, I just uh, finished that corner. And you can see now that the material left on the wall is nice and even all the way around. After I did that, I then used that, uh, I used tool 4, which is a, another tool of the same diameter, just for finishing. And then I walked around the whole contour of that part. So if I look at it from the top, you can see here that I just walked around the part to get that final shape. After I did that, I grabbed tool number 10 and I drilled those two holes to get that material out of there. You can see the drill was slightly smaller. So there is some material on those walls. Then there's some O-rings in here that I had to machine. And I use this slotting uh, toolpath. Uh, it works really good. Uh, the size of that groove. Uh, so let me get in here and do some inspection. So if I measure from this line to that line, you can see my distance is 0.135. Uh, the tool that I used was 0.125 or 1 8 of an inch. And so then what I wanted to do is rough that material, rough all that material out on those, both of those slots for the O-ring. And I just went right down the center. I could have done a 2D contour and went down uh, one side and did a stock to leave to keep the tool off that. But uh, in a case like this, I just used the slot command and it drives that tool right down the center. Works really good. So uh, here I am on the slot that roughed the center, left a little bit, bit of material, five thousandths of material on each wall. So then I came in and then I did a 2D contour and you could see I hit each wall. So if I zoom in here, 
I kind of ramped in, walked around that wall with this toolpath and that hit the outer wall. And then this blue line here hit this inner wall. So that took me to the final width and depth of that. I don't see any more questions. Thanks, Brad, for manning the chat. And thank you, everybody that's participating. Appreciate the 22 thumbs ups and uh, the engagement. Feel free to, um, okay, so I see uh, something on there about NPT. That is national pipe thread. It's a national standard. Okay, so after we do the O-ring groove, we finish that. Then I needed to drill these holes out. And I used uh, tool number 11 to drill these holes here. And if I look at it from the front view, you can see the, the tool drilling the holes and it's going through the model. So if I look at it from this view, you can see it's kind of hard to tell that where the model is, but yeah, there it is. You can kind of see the drill is breaking through. Then, because I have a five axis machine, I have some holes on this side here. Yeah, I've got that hole and I've got that hole. So with this next tool path, I drilled that hole. So to do that, and you can see, if you look at it from this view, you can see it's at an angle there. And then uh, and tools uh, straight up and down there. So with the five axis machine, you can get uh, the orientation properly to get those two holes. So I did that one and that one. If I didn't have a five axis machine, it would have to be done in a completely separate operation. I will go ahead and show. So you can see uh, there's those threaded holes right there. I'll try to hold it still so it focuses. You can see it there. And those guys go down in. So you can get, get an idea of what that's like. So to do that uh, in this setup was super easy. Uh, didn't really have to do much, but I'll show you how I did that because you need to change the orientation from your tool coming this way to set your orientation with that bore. So I'll show you how I did that. So in this operation, I just selected drilling. So I'm gonna right mouse click and hit edit. And so I got my tool, uh, it's a 7 16 diameter drill. And on geometry, let me come to this view. You'll notice that I selected a whole face and I simply just selected the inside diameter of that bore. And that puts the blue, the Z axis, uh, normal to that hole. So it's in line with that bore. And my zoom is not cooperating, there we go. Sorry about that. So now that I have my tool orientation with that bore, you can see that's pointing that way. Then on my whole face, I selected that blue inner face for the geometry. And that's, uh, that's how I selected that hole. Then under the heights tab, I told it to go to the bottom of the modeled hole and break that drill tip through the bottom. So you can kind of pay attention there. And if you uncheck this guy, you can see it's a little bit different. Uh, if I just hover over that, you can see what that does. It'll take the tip of the drill, break it all the way through so that the outside diameter of the drill goes to the bottom of the hole. So we do want that on, and that gets that little edge of the drill where my mouse currently is to go deeper so that it gets passed in there. Mainly I was focused on this corner right there. Okay, and then the cycle I did, I had through spindle coolant on this machine, so I just uh, drilled uh, with the G81, which is drill straight in and then wrap it out. There was no pecking on this. So on a coolant fed drill, see it says through tool here. Uh, normally we would use flood, but I did through tool. So that would give me the M88 for that uh, coolant through the tool. And that just pushes all the, the coolant comes through the tip of the drill and flushes those chips out. So you don't need to uh, do any pecking. Works really well. And that one I actually did at 4,500 RPM. I did uh, 10 inches per 
10 inches, 10 thou per revolution, and it worked great. Okay, I'll just hit cancel because I didn't change anything. So that's how I did those two. And again, I did the same thing for this hole. I just picked a different drill. Uh, sorry, I used the same drill. It's a different hole size. Uh, one is a quarter, 18, and one is 3 eighths. I'm going to show you how I actually board those next. So again, if you're looking at uh, this part here on the top, let me pause it there for a minute. On the top of those threads, I'll try to hold it still so it doesn't, it's not focusing, but there's a chamfer there, and then that whole bore is tapered. So I'm going to show you how I, did, how I did that. You could do that with the countersink, but I did an alternate method. And for me, it's a time saver, and you can, you can have a, get away with less tools in the magazine. So if I come over here, if I look at uh, this operation, chamfer top edge. So let me zoom in and take a look at what that toolpath is doing. So it's entering with that red arrow pointing down, and then it just spiraled around following those blue lines and following that taper. So if we right mouse click and we edit this operation, let's take a look here at the geometry. So for circular face selection, so the tool orientation, you got to turn that on. And then my z-axis, I selected that face because that flat face is uh, perpendicular to these bores. And then the face, I just selected that, that face right there, that cone. And let me hit cancel. Uh, let me come into here. So I used the bore toolpath, and I just told it to step down five thousandths of an inch per pass. So as it spiraled down, it stepped down five thou. Linking, uh, these were my settings for linking, all default. So I'll hit cancel because I didn't change anything. I don't want it to waste any time uh, calculating. But if I run simulate, give that a second to load. While that's loading, I'm going to take a look at the chat. It looks like Oscar Gomez asks, please show the machining and calculation for threaded holes. Okay, I will. All right, so if I hit play here, whoop, let me slow that guy way down. Sorry about that. All right, hold on, let's get to that. Beginning of the toolpath and play. So what that did, that just spiraled down, generated, I can turn off these points now, clean it up, and that generated that chamfer really nice, really smooth. You couldn't even tell that I 3D machined that. So in that same context, I used that same strategy to do that chamfer there and also that tapered, uh, tapered bore there. So after I generate that chamfer edge, this actually went all the way down and you could see it machined that bore there and it's tapered. So I didn't have to get any special tool. I just used a standard bull nose end mill that had a little corner radius on it. Let me zoom in. You can see there's a slight corner radius on that tool and that generated a super, super smooth uh, tool path. And then I did the same thing uh, over for these guys. Those were just straight holes. And then this one is to finish those bores. Uh, this one, I then come back to this side. I broke it up purposely uh, because when I do these types of demos for Haas or any machine tool company, uh, when, when the, in the demo, when you're here and you're machining this, and then uh, if I were to go, you know, do the chamfer and then the threads, it might sit there for two minutes or so. So imagine if you're at a trade show and the machine's sitting there, there's coolant flying everywhere, and there's no real motion on the table. It's just kind of focused on this area. So for that reason, I'll do maybe a little work here, a little work here, a little work here. So what that does, it shows the table kind of moving around and dancing, and it breaks up the monotony. So when people come up to the demo and they're looking in the window with coolant flying everywhere, uh, then it just shows more motion, the tool retracting, repositioning, doing some work in here, repositioning, retracting, repositioning. It just uh, makes it uh, for a better, better looking demo. 
So that's why I kind of bounced around and didn't do those back to back. If I was in a production environment, my strategy would be slightly different. But keep in mind, this is for a demo to dem demonstrate the machine, what it can do, and um, show all the, the wonderful things that, uh, that we can do with the software on that type of a machine. All right. So coming back to this, uh, generate that chamfer, generate that bore, and then I now rotate again, and I deburr that top edge. So I get this question quite a bit. Um, you see the green is the stock, and then the gray is the model. Someone will say, hey, I can't really see the cut of the, you know, what it looks like. Well, that's because the model doesn't have a chamfer on it. So what we'll do, we'll just turn off that. So what you see is just the end result of the stock. Now remember, I have it on transparent. So it's going to look a little, whoops, I clicked out into space. And I clicked off of this. Uh, there we go. So here we go. That's where we were. And... Let me zoom in, trying to show you what I was showing. So you can see the chamfer now. Uh, but if you have this guy turned on, it'll show the model. So keep that in mind, everyone, when you're doing things like this. Uh, is your model on or not? We can even turn this guy on there too. All right, next. So let me move this here. And then I did deburring of those of all those holes and the tops of the o-ring here's we got the thread milling so this is where we actually generate the thread so let me come into here let me turn that guy off and you can see through the transparency you can see the threads being cut into the material so let me come over here I'll right mouse click, let me simulate this. Give that a second to load. And if I hit play, whoop, slow that guy down and go back to the start of that toolpath. Now the model's off, but we're gonna see this tool plunge down on an internal thread. It starts at the bottom and works its way upward. So it will plunge to the final depth. And once it gets to the final depth, it's gonna spiral outward and upward. So here it goes. It's spiraling in a counterclockwise direction. Let me speed that up just a little bit. And I did it twice. I did two passes, and it came out really nice. All right. Close out of that. And then the next thing I did was I did the same uh, thread for the 3 eighths. Got a little bit of a delay. My beach ball, uh, you know, on the Mac, you get that beach ball when it's uh, thinking. So, okay, we're back. And then I did the thread mill on this side. And then I contoured around the periphery. And I did that uh, because sometimes when you're doing work on the outside of the part, uh, it gives it a, uh, if there's any like cross holes or holes coming out of it, if you just walk around it one more time, it comes out super smooth. Um, just cleans things up if there's any burrs. So that's why I do that. Uh, let's come back here and I'm gonna turn uh, this back on just so that the, the model is there. I'm gonna take a look and see if there's any questions. We got uh, 50 people watching. Thank you, 26 thumbs ups, awesome. All right, so uh, I could run this whole uh, simulation. Let's right mouse click here and simulate. And we'll watch that whole thing go. Um, let's turn the stock back on. And I'm going to hit play. Whoops, I need to show this just the tail. Clean things up a bit. All right, so now let me start that over. And there's the simulation. I can slow this down a tad. Watch this guy cut. But that's basically how I did it. 
and excuse the the jerkiness I don't know why my performance on my computer today is not happy okay fish fat asks did you model the fixtures or import from the manufacturer thank you great question fish fat and great name <laughs> yes so the fixtures uh, I got those from the Lang uh, Lang work holding website uh, we just recently did drop those into our cam samples in fusion we've I'll show you where those live uh, let's see is there a place where we can get the fusion file from this webinar ah great question I'll post it in the uh, in the comments below, uh, I'll drop it there, a link to this, so you guys can open it and explore it and see what I did and see what it looks like and analyze each toolpath and what I did and just see kind of my workflow. Uh, so yeah, I'll drop that in there. Uh, something about the soft jaws. Okay. Oh yeah, I was going to show you where, uh, let me go back to this where those uh, where you could find those so let me get out of the simulation and maybe what i'll do is i'll talk about the second op you know what there's not a whole lot let me quickly show you so if you go to the data panel here and you go to the home you scroll all the way down i got a bunch you're going to look for uh cam samples double click that uh, work holding and you're gonna look for Lang so if you double click that we've got these are the macro grip vices so all the vices are in here you can right mouse click and insert into current design I'm currently a manufacturer right now but you'd have to be in design um, and I can back go back to the profilo these are the uh, soft jaws so the profilo is what I used on the right hand side the macro grip is what I used on uh, this one here, the right-hand side for the Operation 1. Those are the steel jaws. And you can find the right uh, part number, model number, and drop it into your assembly. Um, we like to keep things simple for you guys and just bring things in. So now zero point, if I double-click that guy, these are so like one of these uh, round ones that's what this guy is and that's permanently mounted so I just do an assembly and I uh, put the vise in there and I put the stock in there so to answer your question did I model them or get them from the manufacturer we get these models from Lang Direct so they are current and active and they should they are going to be in your cam samples again go to work holding find what you need we have house automation in there as well we have fifth axis orange vice raptor mighty bite this is always being updated as well so again go to lang and then um zero point so i covered the macro grip is the vice profilo is this style jaw zero point is the base there and then avanti is another style uh, like a quick release jaw so they're all in here for you guys to use all right, so let's power through the next few minutes and I'll show you what I did on the second operation. So I'll activate that, expand it, and uh, I'm carrying the stock over. Um, so let me show you what I did. Right mouse click, edit. And on the stock, under mode, I said use the stock from the preceding setup and check this continue rest machining and what that does fusion will automatically take the resulting stock from the first operation and apply it to the second operation since I didn't change anything I'm gonna hit cancel so you can see the stock and this stock is directly created from when we did the first operation so if I made any changes to the first operation the resulting stock uh, which is actually let me show my camera so that's now this, and I'm grabbing it in the vise, like on all the smooth faces that are machined. So I'm grabbing it there in those soft jaws, and we're going to remove this top, this top hat area. 
So that's what it looks like after it's done on the first operation. And then we simply flip it over and finish this side. And when we flip it over, uh, this is, yeah, get the orientation right, sorry. So this is the orientation. And then if we flip it here, so that all needs to be machined. So I'll talk about that here in the next few minutes. Uh, we can power that through that quickly and get, give you an idea. So uh, very first thing I did there is I machined using the contour toolpath, using that shell, shell mill, just to get the general shape. Whoops, I need to change my screen. Sorry. So I got this little, uh, let me show you. So what I mean is I want to get this outer shape and I want to get this guy, remove this material. So the first operation, I contour around that. Okay, next, I then, with that same tool, I cut this big step out and I got a bulk of the material out with that same tool. That's that three inch shell mill, works really great. And I was just throwing chips. Next, so you can see the green stock material remaining. Next, I use a facing toolpath strategy and I set my tool orientation like this. And I machined that little area there. And what I did here, just quickly show you on the tool orientation, that was a Z face. So that was a Z normal. And then uh, stock contours, I said, the stock that I wanna remove is contained within that area. I'll hit cancel since I didn't change anything and I wanna recalculate everything downstream. And then next, so this is what I had remaining. You can see the green stock. I want to get this material out of this corner to finish that step. So I used a uh, half inch diameter tool to get rid of that. I then kicked up the orientation this way. So if you look at the part, so I had that little material there to get rid of. So I used tool orientation and a 2D contour to machine that. I then change the orientation again. And again, I do that just so the machine moves more, uh, demo as well. And then I did a contour, finish that. So again, keeping with that tradition, making the machine bounce around just to show the different orientations. And then I flip the orientation one more time and I just did a 2D contour, walk around that triangular area. And then here, I drill some holes. I did that one and I did this one. And again, I'm bouncing around from this orientation to that orientation on purpose. I could have done you know, these uh, more uh, efficiently, but again, I'm bouncing around from operation to operation. And then here's the thread, and then I chamfer those, and then I finish that tapered wall, because that's a pipe thread there for 3 8 18. Then I finish these counter bores, I did a 2D chamfer to deburr some areas. So I deburred that area. I deburred inside that hole. I deburred on this front edge. Uh, let's see if we could change my screen. Where's my, you can see uh, that front edge. I deburred it. I wish it wasn't, the, I wish it was a clear image and uh, just carrying on, I did some deburring uh, chamfer mill. So that was a big chamfer there. This guy was that big chamfer edge there. I deburred this top edge here. Next I did a thread mill here because I already bored those. I chamfered it. I did the chamfered face and then the bore. Now these two uh, will do the threading. Then I did some engraving. Uh, there were some letters in here. One said, this one here said feed sensor. This one says drain and this says in. And then this one here, I did that in a second op. And the reason why I did that, so if I look at it from the top, you can see where it's plunging in red there. And if I go to the previous one where it ends here, um, just to be safe, because I didn't want it wrapping from here to here and doing maybe a dog leg move or whatnot and risk getting close. 
So I just broke those up into two separate operations. So the tool would uh, retract and just be safe. Next, I wanted to deburr uh, this chamfer here that's highlighted, and then this chamfered edge, uh, that edge along the front edge of the part. And this uh, swarf here it was the video I showed in the very first, uh, in the beginning. So that's the swarf there and there. And if I play that, you can get a quick view of that. We're a few minutes over. Uh, Mr. Coffee Paul asks, can we hope for a live stream on turning? Yes, I will do a live stream on turning. And this is, uh, now my computer froze up for a second. <laughs> uh, someone has another in question. Okay, I have another question as I saw the engraving. How do you do them? Sketch with text or do you model them and then machine? Ah, great question. So let me just play this swarf really quick. Oh man, I had that going way too fast. Start that again. Again, Let's rewind that bad boy. And again, apologies for the delay. Sometimes when I when I'm connected uh, with these, my computer, it's, uh, there we go. So play that guy. So you can see it coming in. I'm cutting that small chamfer with the side of the tool. Nice and easy there. Go a little bit faster. So that's that tool path. Rounds that corner. Again, keeping the side flute touching that modeled chamfer. Whoops. There you go. So let's end that simulation. And then what I did after I did the swarf on those two chamfers, then I, I took that face mill and I went over the top. And I went over the top because after I engraved it, sometimes depending on how sharp your tool is, uh, if it gets dull, it'll leave a slight little burr, a slight little burr at the top. So this face mill uh, just went and uh, just kissed it and just went along the top. So that's uh, the sequence that I used uh, to machine that part. Hopefully you guys got something out of it. Uh, there was a quick question on engraving. So what I do is I go to design, then I'll come here to create. Uh, obviously we need a new sketch and then let's uh, click somewhere. I must have pre-selected something wrong. But when you're in sketch, uh, you go here to create text. And then uh, let's pick somewhere where we're going to put something. And then under the font, what I use is I scroll all the way to the top. You see this uh, .shx extension? Those are the single stroke fonts. Imagine like stick figures. So I used an ISO. So see where it says sample text there? I clearly cr created that in the wrong space. But that single stroke font is what you then, um, so let's go here, live stream. So then you would engrave that. You'd obviously place that on your part. And then uh, I use a trace toolpath to machine that. I'm just going to cancel out of that. Hopefully that answers that question. Let's go back to my uh, this camera. Uh, I'm going to take a quick look at the chat. Uh, Brad, okay, looks like Jan asked a question. Oh, so that answer that for Jan. Hopefully that answers your question. I could touch more on that and talk about that in a future live stream. If there's no other questions, um, thank you. I see 36 thumbs up. 55 people watching. We appreciate it. It's a privilege being here, sharing kind of what's in my mind, something that goes into making a part like this. Um, I get great en enjoyment out of doing these things and then showing you guys how I did that. And you can see that engraving turned out really nice. This was obviously a setup part, but uh, I cleaned up some things or you can see there's a little uh, where it walked around. It kind of gouged a little bit there, but all right. I don't see any more questions. With that, <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Brad, thank you. You're the man. Always uh, 
enjoy doing these with you in my corner, and I enjoy being your wingman during my live streams as well. To all the regulars, uh, you know who you are. You know how to reach us. Uh, drop any questions in the comments. Uh, we appreciate the thumbs up. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Brad will be up uh, next Thursday, same time, same place, and I'll be his wingman. And then in a future one, I'll have to do uh, for Mr. Coffee Paul, I'll do one on turning. If there's anything you'd like to see, drop it in the chat, and maybe I can cater that towards uh, your questions uh, or whatever you suggest. So cool. All right, everybody. Oh, Mr. Al Watmo, you got here in time for the end. You missed it, but please watch the recording. You know how to find that, Al. Uh, Al's the man. If you guys don't know who Al is, Al uh, is the reason I'm at Autodesk. He hired me years ago, and he was my boss for a while. And he uh, he's instrumental in a lot of goodness in everything cam-related in Fusion. So thanks, Al, for all of that. Okay, everybody, I'm done. You guys have a great day, and we will see you next time. See ya.